the second lecture will be on hemodynamic optimization during mechanical ventilation. As you know, that uh, heart-lung interaction or mechanical ventilation interaction with uh, uh, the cardiovascular system. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Professor Dr. Uh, uh, Muhammad Al-Gindi. Dr. Muhammad Al-Gindi has graduated from uh, Faculty of Medicine Ayn Shams University, completed his postgraduate training in anesthesiology and intensive care medicine with MD degree. He is a director of internal and external fellowship programs in uh, surgical critical care department of Ayn Shams University. He had a, le a leading program in mechanical ventilation. So you are talking the expert, talking to the expert of today, uh, training in critical care physician across Egypt uh, through being a board member of the Egyptian Society of Intensive Care and Trauma. He led uh, and organized multiple national ultrasound training programs, uh, being a member for the, in, in the American uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine. And he is currently the deputy director of Ayn Shams Surgical Intensive Care Department and the board member in the Egyptian Society of Intensive Care and Trauma Medicine. Uh, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Mohamed Al-Gindi, please go ahead and start your presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alid, for uh, this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, thank you for uh, your kind invitation. Uh, thanks for all of the uh, scientific committee of the group. And thanks to Dr. Magid uh, for his uh, very nice uh, lecture of the practical and clinical uh, guidelines for TEE. I think uh, you both were very brave using TEE in this uh, COVID era and exposing yourself a little bit much more. Uh, God bless you uh, all. Um, our talk today will be about the hemodynamic optimization during mechanical ventilation. Some of the new insights are this. I think everybody of us, uh, while entering his uh, ICU in the morning, is usually asking his, himself a question. What is the objective of you monitoring for each single case uh, in your ICU? If uh, you are faced by this guy who is 72 years old, a male uh, patient presented to the ER by an acute abdomen for which uh, he was diagnosed to have a strangulated and stinal obstruction following uh, hernia. Uh, uh, I think things are going fine, was it? Okay. Yes, you're okay. Okay. Uh, and you are faced by this guy who is presented to the OR. Uh, and uh, went uh, on exploration and you have received him in your ICU unit uh, with this uh, very nice uh, demonstration of his vital data. His tachycardic, his saturation is borderline, uh, the same as uh, his invasive blood pressure, CVP, and maybe the LAP is still uh, confusing. I think we should go to the physiology first. We need to discuss our physiological considerations uh, involving the venous return and cardiac output in this type of critical patients, which we all face daily. A very nice um, a basic uh, interpretation for a Guyton model. Um, Professor Guyton, Arthur Guyton, has um, illustrated uh, the physiology of venous return and cardiac output. Uh, a long time ago, in 1955. And he actually demonstrated, uh, as you see in this slide, that the circulation is composed, sorry, from a venous side of circulation, uh, demonstrated by this tank, uh, containing a stressed volume, unstressed volume. The stressed volume, you know all, that this is the volume of the venous circulation, which shares in the venous return and can apply a pressure on the uh, on the venous wall, yielding what we know all by mean systemic venous pressure or mean systemic feeling pressure. This is uh, this is accompanied by the central venous circulation, which is the right atrium, and the accompanying v IVC and SVC, followed by the cardiac chambers, and lastly the arterial circulation. To have a good cardiac output yielding from the cardiac chamber, you should always have a good venous return. So this was the, the main issue in studying the physiology of cardiovascular system in this era. And he yielded a very nice, very nice demonstration of this uh, correlation by uh, putting the venous return equation, which will, will be equal to the gradient between the 
suppression inside the venous circulation in the systemic venous circulation, which is, which is standard or expressed by the mean systemic vein pressure, minus the right atrial pressure, which is the pressure in the central venous circulation uh, near to the heart, and divided uh, actually by the resistance to this driving pressure to pass the venous return. In other words, this is published in the American Journal of Physiology, as we can all see, in 1957. By other words, if we change this to graphs, uh, a little bit uh, concentration about the left side, left upper side venous return graphs will show you briefly the correlation between the venous return in the y, in the y axis and the uh, right atrial pressure or the CVP, as we all know, on the I and the X axis. Simply, uh, he demonstrated, uh, Professor Guyton, that as long as there is an increase in the cardiac output on the Y axis, there is a, a decrease in the a, a, a proportional increase or proportional increase in the CVP until you got a correlation in which the venous return is getting down while the cardiac output is getting up until the means the, the, the right atrial pressure is equal to a point which may be seven centimeter or millimeter mercury, at which the venous return is equal to zero. This point is the equilibrium between the mean systemic feeling pressure and the right atrial pressure. At this point, venous return is equal to zero and cardiac output actually will be zero. At this point, this is the mean systemic feeling pressure, which express the point at which there is equilibrium or zero flow in the venous circulation. On the other side, Frank and Starling has demonstrated a very nice correlation between the preload of the left ventricle or the preload of the heart or the ventricular and diastolic volume on the I and the X axis and the stroke volume or the cardiac output, the same and again, the cardiac output on the Y axis. But this uh, correlation is standing in the correlation between the venous return and the stroke volume or the ventricular and diastolic volume and the stroke volume. As you all know, the frank starling curve demonstrates a exponentially rising or a steep part of the curve as long as the stretching of the ventricle is associated by increased stroke volume till it reaches the flat point at which any increase in the preload of stroke volume, uh, sorry, uh, any increase in the preload of the venous return will not anymore cause an increased stroke volume. When he put the, put the both graphs on the same uh, chart, there is a correlation between the Frank Sterling curve and the Venus return curve. The increase in the right atrial pressure or the CVP with a drop in the Venus return on one side and the increase in cardiac output on the other side. The, the, the point of interest here is the point of equilibrium. What we say the point of equilibrium is the point where the venous return on the left uh, graph will be equal to the P at the cardiac output at this phase. What does this mean? This means that if you extrapolate the Frank Stanley curve against the venous return curve, you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas in this point A on the venous return curve while uh, intersecting with the stern, uh, Frank Sterling curve. So increasing the blood volume will shift this point A to point B. It's the same intersection between the venous return and the cardiac output with a much more increase in the cardiac output by increasing the blood volume. While coming from point A to point C, while with the hypovolemia or decreasing blood volume, the cardiac output will decrease. So decreasing CVP, decreasing the, uh, the volume, will uh, drop the, the cardiac output from point A to point C, as long as you are on the steep part of the curve of Frank Stanley curve. But as you all imagine, if the three points are coming on the flat part of the curve, there will, no change, there will be no change in the cardiac output, either by increase in point A or B, or decrease in point C. By another means, uh, this is a very uh, nice illustration by Edwards uh, uh, when they uh, explained 
the innovation by using stroke volume variation on the frame styling curve, the same point, if you are going by pressure difference in the steep portion of the curve, you get a much more increases stroke volume. Mass. If you have uh, to uh, think about preload uh, dependence or uh, the physiology of the venous return and the physiology of cardiac output with the basics of physics, you should think that these two curves of the venous return and the cardiac output of Frank Sterling, as long as they are in this zone, in this gray zone, the patient is a preload dependent. So any increase in the CVP from any point here to another point here will be associated with increasing cardiac output and most probably um, decreasing a little bit in the venous return. So in this part of the curve, the patient will be a preload dependent, while after passing this part of the zone of both curves, any increase in the CVP will lead to marked, marked decrease in the venous return and most probably no increase in cardiac output. This is the theory behind using the preload uh, principle in volume responsiveness. Uh, if, if you like to put it on figures, so or, or, or numbers or digits, this is the, the curve of the venous return before a volume and after volume uh, administration. And this is the Frank Sterling curve with the stroke volume or uh, cardiac output against the CVP. If you increase CVP from seven to nine, you got a, a change in the right atrial pressure of average two to three. And you have the mean systemic feeling pressure increasing from 25 to 31. You got a gradient between the mean systemic feeling pressure and right atrial pressure of about uh, three. And you got an increase in cardiac output much more recordable from 2.8 to 3.2. But always think that in this zone, or in this part of the graph of intersection between the venous return and the Frank styling, this is the steep part of the curve. But if you go to the flat part of the curve, the increase in CVP and, uh, and the accompanying increase in the mean system feeling pressure may be of a very low gradient. And at the same time, the patient will not be if uh, preload responsive and the cardiac output will fail to pass from one point to another as long as it is on the flat part of the curve. That's why the physiology counts up. So, what is our objectives today? Our objectives today, uh, in the next couple of minutes, this logical background means to correlate this physiological background with indices to be more practical we will discuss three main examples. The first example will check the change in stroke volume or, and or the cardiac output by using a tidal volume challenge during mechanical ventilation and will, will be discussed in a, very, in a few seconds. And the second example will resemble using the echo machine to assess the cardiac output changes during the using of end expiratory pose or end expiratory occlusion maneuver and end expiratory maneuver. And the last example will be using the passive leg raising, which is the classical method, and collating it to the plethysmography index or the perfusion uh, index uh, run by the plethysmography or the pulse oximeter. To get things very uh, practical, uh, we should first be uh, on the same ground that there is a lot of consensus in the European society and the surviving sepsis campaign in the previous decade, confirming that the, there is a strong recommendation to use a dynamic indices and not a static indices to predict if the patient is a fluid responsive case or not. You can use a lot of a portfolio or machines, starting from the most invasive pulmonary artery catheter, which is uh, uh, along the previous is uh, still the gold standard, to a many, many invasive machines like Osophageal Duplo, Clotrad, Virginia, or uh, Edwards machine, or the, even the Pico machine using uh, pass pressure variation, or the Clotrad using stroke volume variation, to end by the very nice non-invasive uh, study by the ECHO. So, the first example will go through uh, the respiratory variation of stroke volume using the respiratory variation of stroke volume 
uh, using the, our third volume challenge protocol to make things more uh, confirmed. This is a very nice study uh, published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine by the, in the year 2000, confirming that there is a very nice correlation between sensitivity and using pulse pressure variation during mechanical ventilation to assess your patient capability to uh, respond to a fluid bolus. Uh, on the contrary of the CVP or the uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. So uh, this was a very uh, 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 this very uh, uh, new uh, revision by the same group for the applicability of the past pressure variation or, or how many shades of gray we do have. Actually, there are a lot of limitation about using this very, uh, dynamic indices in mechanical ventilation and in other uh, uh, limitation uh, problems. You may have the false positive and false negative results. If you have a low heart rate respiratory rate ratio, what, uh, what's behind this is bradycardia or a little bit uh, tachypnea. If you have too much extreme bradycardia or much tachypnea, there is a very poor uh, correlation for the PPV or the pulse pressure variation as an index for fluid responsiveness. If you use the irregular heartbeats or the arrhythmia, still you have a false positive presence. Mechanical ventilation, if the, the tidal volume is using the, the low tidal volume or the lung protective strategy, you will be having a lot of false negative presence. And this is our issue in the next slides. So, we will concentrate about using the mechanical ventilation, using low tidal volume, and having the study of Jean-Louis de Paul in 2015 saying that it has a lot of false negative predictive values in uh, fluid responsiveness. Maybe, maybe this, uh, this is very clear in the same, in the same uh, context, context uh, by using a normal tidal volume, in this pink color, if I think uh, the color is uh, true, all uh, the dotted uh, arrow of the low tidal volume, there is a very much uh, difference in the validity of the PPV uh, and sensitivity of using the PPV between using the normal tidal volume and low tidal volume. So what is the solution? A couple of years ago, uh, Jean-Louis Tupol and his French group have published in the Critical Care Medicine a very nice illustrative uh, review about using what is called tidal volume challenge. Tidal volume challenge is using the low tidal volume protocol in your patient who is ventilated, but with the transient increase in the tidal volume from six mile per kg to eight mile per kg, and transient increase one minute tidal volume challenge, and we share the cardiac output variation, a strong volume variation during the low tidal volume, during the, low, the uh, larger tidal volume or the tidal volume challenge, pre and post, and back again after the one minute to the six mile per kg, and lastly compared it to giving a volume of a fluid bolus on the low tidal volume stretch. And uh, to make things more uh, uh, illustrative, uh, this is, was the, the type of patients he examined, they were around 30 cases. Um, most of them, 100% of them was receiving a, a vasopressor or norepinephrine, and, more, and all of them was using a tidal volume baseline of sequence. For the sake of time, this is the, uh, the row curve of using a pulse pressure variation, a tidal volume of six mile per kg, and the, another comparative curve while the tidal volume challenge is being used with a much more increase uh, on the, in, the, in the sensitivity of the test or the sensitivity of the pulse pressure variation after using a tidal volume challenge with a cutoff value of 3.5 uh, as delta PPV or change in pulse pressure variation after changing from six mile per kg to eight mile per kg. So this makes uh, more th uh, things more clear that if you have a cutoff value of 3.5% uh, increase in your PPV after increasing the total volume by this volume challenge, you can give this your patient the fluid and he will not suffer from any drop in the hemodynamics and most probably is a fluid responsive case 
because increasing the tidal volume with the change in the uh, intrathoracic pressure yielded a PPV of more than 3%. And this comes back again that the motor cardiac output or stroke volume changes with the mechanical ventilation in this part of the curve, the more likely the patient will be preload response. The other issue is using uh, the end expiratory pose or the end expiratory occlusion maneuver or the end expiratory occlusion maneuver or both in assessing the changes in the cardiac output due to mechanical ventilation. And if there is a correlation between these poses or these maneuvers and uh, a change in the stroke volume, definitely this will mean that the stroke volume can accept a good volume and this patient may be most probably a fleet response. So you are going again to challenging this keep to the curve by and end expiratory and end inspiratory maneuvers. A very nice illustration in the research lab, uh, st st studying the correlation between the airway pressure, stroke volume, and CVP. If you are, this is the airway pressure curve, and this is the plateau, the start of plateau, and you are putting the patient into end inspiratory pose, the stroke volume dropped in uh, maybe in seconds, and the CVP is rising, and this makes sense, that you are increasing too much the intrathoracic pressure, decreasing the venous return while increasing the CVP, and back again, the venous return is decreased because the CVP is high, and the gradient between the mean systemic venous pressure, mean systemic venous pressure, and the right atrial pressure is getting very low because of the CVP rising, so the cardiac output will be lastly dropping. If you compare like um, the group of uh, Jensen and uh, uh, Jacinta, uh, the assessment of venous return by end expiratory hold and end expiratory hold, you'll find what I'm saying is very true. If you put the end expiratory hold here in this part, this is the airway pressure curve, this end expiratory hold, this is a, a, a drop in the CVP and an increase in the stroke volume. While on the other side, the end inspiratory hold, as, as we have just mentioned, the end inspiratory hold will get you with a low stroke volume and maybe a higher CVP. So to make things practical more and more, and as we approaching our, the end of our lecture, what about predicting fluid responsiveness by using a combination of end expiratory and expiratory occlusions by an echo machine. It's a very nice study. Uh, I, I hope everybody of us can uh, catch it in the critical care medicine. Uh, but the French group actually is a Claire Monet and his uh, a colleague Jean Louis Paul and uh, still uh, Josiac uh, as primary uh, investigators. Uh, they used the same tidal volume in the mechanically ventilated patients, uh, low tidal volume strategy, six mile per kg. And you can count on the presence of PEEP of 10, despite rate of 25 to 27, and all the variables uh, are discussed here. But what about this slide? Very nice start, very nice slide. And I think um, uh, um, we have discussed uh, in a couple of, uh, the last couple of years, the ultrasound courses we are adopting, and uh, maybe you need the, and uh, Dr. Sham and Dr. Mangid and everybody in the panel show me uh, that this is a very nice protocol. If you are using the mechanical ventilator patient and you have the echo machine and you can put your probe on the LVOT or the left ventricular outflow tract and you can put the, uh, uh, the probe to study the velocity time integral or the surrogate of the stroke volume uh, in the left ventricular outflow tract by using Doppler flow. You can check the VTI uh, in the LVOT. This is the baseline. After putting the patient on end expiratory occlusion, uh, you can find there is a much more increase in the VTI in, in the group of patients who are fluid responders. And if it is followed by an end expiratory occlusion, there is a marked decrease in the VTI in the same group of patients who are fluid responders. So in the, at that moment, you can give your patient a bolus of volume of crystalloid or colloid, um, 250 to 500 ml, and you can check 
there is a fear that there is an increase in VTI again in the flint responder group. So there is the four stages. You are using the echo in the four stages. You can use the velocity time integral uh, across the LVOT to check the variability in changes in the scope volume in concordance to an a ventilatory uh, uh, approach or maneuver versus fluid administration maneuver. I think this um, is clear uh, at the end of the study is having uh, the very good sensitivity of using the end expired occlusion uh, with a VTI. And again, uh, a line, very, very clear line of demarcation on the right up uh, panel, viewing a very clear line of demarcation between the fluid responders and non responders with a 5% change in the VTI between uh, above 5% increase in the VTI is a very good uh, a correlation with the fluid responders and below 5% is a very good correlation with non responders By uh, digital values, you can imagine, but you, uh, in, the, in the lower panel, the end expired occlusion, uh, there is a, a marked uh, increase in the VTI in case of the fluid responders by 11 uh, centimeter of uh, flow or VTI increase, while non-responders very minimal increase during end expiratory occlusion, same in the end, end inspiratory occlusion. And the best results may be with combining both maneuvers, which will uh, too much matching the uh, results of the field administration. That there is a very great difference between the responders and non-responders regarding the VTI measurement in the two types of patients. Uh, lastly, I would like to spotlight very rapidly about the passive bed raising test. You don't, you don't, you, you, you shouldn't, and you, you, you don't have to forget using the very simple maneuver of passive bed raising on uh, on regular basis to check the dynamic indices of your preload responsiveness uh, in critical care patients. Uh, this. Is, uh, the very famous editorial about the five rules with the not drop of fluid published by Jean-Louis Topol uh, in the critical medicine uh, five years ago. Uh, you can, everybody can join uh, and uh, revise the five main rules uh, by which you can do a successful, uh, accurate uh, maneuver for a passive aggression. Um, it is, uh, this is the meta-analysis confirming by 21 clinical study and 995 patients the changes in the cardiac output related in passive leg raising can truly predict uh, the fluid responsiveness of the patient. What about the perfusion index or uh, passive leg raising uh, assessment by using the perfusion index uh, by the maximum machine? It's a very nice uh, non-invasive strategy. A lot of studies uh, demonstrated this correlation, and I think uh, actually I didn't uh, get through um, a lot of uh, studies in our uh, in Egypt, but uh, I'm sure that uh, a couple of our colleagues in uh, Qasr Aini have done a very good and very nice work about using the perfusion index uh, as a, a marker of uh, the fluid responsiveness in a couple of cases starting from uh, OR, passing to the ICU. And actually in our, in Ancient University, we have a couple of studies running on this, uh, on this machine using this perfusion index uh, to derive the, the, uh, the possibility of having fluid responsiveness correlated to uh, the seismography signal. Simply, it depends that the, uh, on the idea that the seismography or the pulsometry uh, draw you a signal of arterial pulse wave, which is composite of two main components. The non pulsatile part, which is dependent on the venous and capillary blood, with the minimal part of the non pulsatile arterial blood, and the pulsatile component, which is composed of the stroke volume, the amplitude of the maximum, uh, the maximum amplitude of the wave, the dichotic notch, and the diastolic part of the a wave by uh, mathematical uh, modality, uh, um, the, the, the machine can 
uh, divide or correlate between the pulsatile amplitude and the non-pulsatile amplitude, so resulting in the perfusion index, which most probably will be affected by the stroke volume, depending on the upstroke or the amplitude or of uh, the systolic component of the arterial pressure waveform of the plasmography, and the elastance and um, compliance of the vessels with the uh, volume status presented by the dichotic loach and the diastolic part of the curve. So this perfusion index will be influenced by the local vasodilatation, vasoconstriction, and by the stroke volume. Actually, uh, uh, we should be concerned about the local factors affecting this index. Uh, a very nice study uh, published in the European Society of uh, 72 patients, 90% uh, of them were mechanically ventilated. A lot of them has uh, on the low tidal volume strategy, 86%, and 72% were receiving the no epinephrine. And they demonstrated a very nice correlation between the changes, uh, um, uh, the passive leg raising maneuver has uh, ended through uh, by increasing the perfusion index in the lower graph and increasing the cardiac index in the upper graph. And they seem to be very much similar uh, correlation between the changes in the perfusion index by the machine and the changes in the cardiac index by the regular uh, machines or the regular uh, cardiac output assessment. Uh, this is a passive leg raising uh, maneuver number one and the second passive leg raising maneuver and upon change, upon uh, having a very good response uh, by perfusion index and uh, cardiac index, uh, the research group have adopted using volume expansion with a marked increase in the perfusion index and the cardiac index uh, going in the same direction. So to conclude, uh, I would like to share you uh, some ideas that there is new modalities for hemodynamic optimization during mechanical ventilation. Maybe some of them include the type of challenge, uh, which we've uh, just discussed, uh, using a combination of end expiratory occlusion and inspiratory occlusion maneuver. The response of using a non-invasive machine like perfusion index to the passive leg raising uh, maneuver. All of this can overcome some of the limitations of the more classical dynamic variables. Uh, and at this point, at this point, I would like to thank you all uh, for your uh, valuable time and thank you for the organizing committee. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Prof. Gendi, uh, for this comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions, one from myself and one from uh, attendees. So I'm... Um, Selfish, so I will give you my question first. Uh, if you give me in a nutshell your advice, before we do a recruitment maneuver, the blood pressure tends to drop with our recruitment maneuver. So will you advise me to add vasopressors as a standby and use them if the patient drops his blood pressure? Or give him a fluid bolus before the recruitment maneuver? Or do a passive leg raise, I'm, I'm not calling it a test now, so I put his legs up to auto transfuse him uh, as a prophylactic maneuver before we recruit him. What do you advise and why? Uh, very complex and very uh, uh, nice question, which is very difficult always by you. <laughs> I think um, all of us uh, will share the answer, but to my knowledge and to my experience, I usually uh, try my best to evaluate the patient uh, very accurately before doing the recruitment maneuver. Um, I will uh, divide my answer to two parts. The first part will be related to the hemodynamics, as you have just mentioned, and the second part will be uh, directed to the ventilatory part. Regarding the hemodynamics, I do think that um, using a vasopressor or using uh, passive leg raising giving a bonus of volume, all of them may be appropriate at some point. So if you are using a dynamic index for any reason, if you, have using, uh, if you are using a PPV or SVV, or even, the, uh, even um, a PI, perfusion index, or an echo machine, and you can uh, challenge uh, the patient by 
by changing the passive log raising and seeing the VTI or putting an index by occlusion or index by occlusion maneuver and changes uh, in the store volume uh, give you a, a, a brief image. Or you put a tidal volume challenge, this will, this will be fine. Uh, all of them can, can give you an idea. I think you, the clinical experience is matching with uh, doing a passive leg raising and using a vasopressor. Because most of us, usually, as you have just uh, mentioned, uh, experience a very hard time with recruitment maneuver. And usually, there is uh, some sort of uh, drop in the back pressure. So yeah. I, I do prefer using the passive leg raising with uh, a low dose vasopressor after putting uh, the patient with the optimum uh, fluid or volume uh, status. If the passive leg raising is positive, uh, uh, I give him a bonus of volume, then I put the, the least possible dose of vasopressor just in case. But the other issue is that about the lung. If, if the patient is recruitable, most probably his hemodynamics shouldn't be uh, affected, I think. I, I, I do prefer that um, usually we, we can use a very brief recruitment maneuver. It's uh, maybe uh, the 30-30 the or 40-40 maneuver uh, to check the hemodynamics. If the hemodynamics are going fine, so we can go through the stepwise approach or whatever the commental peep maneuver or whatever you like. Uh, but if the, the, the hemodynamics dropped with this very short or brief uh, recruitment maneuver, I think we should shift away uh, and wait till we optimize the fluid status and the vasopressor uh, maneuver. But actually, I, I leave it to your uh, uh, great experience and everybody should have his own protocol uh, while doing this, I think. So can I say, uh, Prof. Kindi, that it depends on his pre-recruitment condition and I should be vigilant enough to do pre-recruitment assessment of his hemodynamic condition because if he's hemodynamically stable in the moment that could be fake because of sympathetic overflow and once I do the sympathetic so the recruitment maneuver his blood pressure drops so it's kind of assessment before recruitment to declare your patient in one of three groups hypervolemic, eovolemic, or hypovolemic before I do the recruitment maneuver. If the passive leg raise test that I did before the recruitment obviously improved the pulse pressure variation, for example, that means he is to the hypovolemic side, so I should give him some fluids before recruitment. If not, I should be ready with vasopressors as a standby. If he drops his blood pressure, I know pre-recruitment that he is not fluid depleted, so he's solution now is vasopressors, not to overload the lungs. Am I okay with that or you have? Definitely, definitely. But the only issue, uh, as I was just mentioned, is if there is a problem with the having in, is a much increase in the intrathoracic pressure by recruitment and the lung is not recruitable, the pressure you apply by recruitment maneuver will be transmitted to the pulmonary vascular uh, 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 vessels getting a shooting of the pulmonary vascular resistance a very much high afterload on the right side, which most probably may fail and get you in a shock state. So definitely, I agree totally with you, but please usually consider that the recruitment, the, the line may be non-recruitable, and okay. if you put it in recruitment and it's non-recruitable, there is no space for the line to inflate, and all the pressure will go on the circulatory, uh, 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 pulmonary circulation and get you a uh, hard time as, as, as we have just mentioned. Perfect. But definitely, this is the, the vascular uh, or the volume status. Definitely, this is uh, completely true. So I'll add to my previous statement and recruit judiciously if needed at all. Perfect. Okay, so this is just to put it in a nutshell or like to sum up. Uh, so the second question is from uh, Madi Hadi. Uh, how to differentiate between preload responsiveness and after load sensitivity, if there is a difference. Uh, okay, preload uh, responsiveness is a, big, is a big issue. This is the correlation between the venous return, the myocardium, and uh, the, 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 the circulatory pool. If you uh, uh, come back to my slides, you can you can you can share it. Uh, 
okay. if you can see this slide, actually, okay. Okay, so if you are studying the correlation between the, the, the Venus return, okay, if you are studying the correlation between the Venus return and the preload, the CVP and the mean systemic feeling pressure on the X axis, and on the other side, the cardiac output, so it's very simple. If you can sustain the optimum uh, uh, Venus return, uh, and this can be studied by one of all the modalities we have just discussed. If either you can check the PPV, the stroke volume variation, the echo VTR, the tidal volume challenge. If you are checking the field responsiveness, you are checking the preload component. And this is, we are finished with it. As, as, I, as I'm, uh, I think we are, we are changing the same idea. If you are having a problem with the preload, you can check it by passive leg raising, so volume variation, pass pressure variation, even either echo. And you can check if there is a variation with the ventilation or if no ventilatory uh, support, you can check the dynamic indices. But uh, the afterload is another big issue because the afterload is multifactorial, depends on using vasopressors and depends on the arterial elastance. So if you are studying the arterial elastance versus the ventricular elastance, what we call the ventricular arterial or ventricular aortic coupling or decoupling, you can stand on a baseline of having the, the arterial coupling with the ventricular activity or the ventricular uh, contractility. Uh, so if the patient is vasoconstricted and you can get him by an echo, you put, you, you put in echo as, as an example, and you put, put the echo, you found a very good stroke volume and a very good contractility. And the, at the end, you have uh, the patient hypertensive and you stroke volume variation and reload is optimum. Then you should think about the ventricular aortic coupling or the arterial system elastance. If you can go through it and put the equation of the arterial elastance or study practically that the echo is fine, the stroke volume is fine, while or the contractility is fine, while the preload is doing fine, so you have a problem with the afterload. You should go in decreasing your afterload by vasodilators instead of putting uh, uh, more and more afterload by vasopressors. And much more, more um, in most cases, uh, if there is a ventricular arterial decoupling, the ventricle is getting a little bit weak and you are having a decompensated myocardium in front of a very high resistance by a vasopressor. So you have, a, you have an echo with the poor functions. And uh, if you measure the, the, the systemic vascular resistance by any of your modalities, you get a very high systemic vascular resistance and you have the poor functions by echo. In that, at that moment, you should go through a vasodilator to the piece of load and in a trope to get the cardiac functions more and more uh, innovative. This is very, very hard to, to be always practical, but you always go step by step, the preload, the cardiac uh, contractility, and then the afterload. Thanks very much, uh, Prof. Mohamed Gindi, uh, for your uh, very nice presentation today. Uh, I would like at the end uh, to thank uh, yourself and uh, Professor Dr. Magid Salah for your uh, valuable contribution to the MEGA online anesthesia ICU and pain course and hopefully see you again uh, soon inshallah after Eid in one of your valuable presentations. Uh, towards the end of this uh, session I would like to thank uh, Dr. Saad Mahdi, Dr. Hisham Mehmed Abdul Masood, uh, Dr. Wida Aswa for their uh, uh, valuable efforts in this course uh, and again I would like to repeat my warm condolences from the bottom of my heart to the families of our colleagues and seniors who uh, sacrificed their lives uh, trying to cure patients from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, my heart is aching when I remember that and I believe I would have been one of those and still it may happen soon for any one of us so this is the least that we can do for them. 
Um, if you can do more, you can contact me or any of the faculty committee, or if you think that we may have um, any added output uh, to this uh, concern or this uh, problem, we are always here to help and support uh, our Egyptian colleagues. Thanks very much for everyone uh, watching us today. Uh, it's, it's an Eid, so I know that uh, you may be busy with your families um, and recordings will be available as soon as we can. Thanks very much. See you everybody soon in the next uh, session of our lectures, inshallah. Salaamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.